peoples. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of these territories, as well as the ongoing processes of colonialism and dispossess dispossession in which we and our institution are implicated. Beyond the stolen territory which we physically occupy, MIT has long profited from the sale of federal lands granted by the Morrill Act, territory stolen from 82 tribes, including the Greater and Little Osage, Chippewa and Omaha peoples. As we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land from time immemorial, we seek to indigenize our institution in the field of planning, offer space and leave indigenous peoples in more empowered positions. Um, so welcome everyone. Today's talk is going to be by, by three experts that have joined us, um, starting with Dr. Diane Austin. She's an applied environmental anthropologist whose work focuses on community dynamics amid large scale industrial activity, alternative technologies to address environmental and social problems, environmental education, impact assessment, and community based collaborative research and outreach. She's a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arizona, and she's developed and maintained long-term multi-sectoral and community-based partnerships with Native American communities, U.S. and Mexican border communities, and communities along the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. She served as an advisor to local, state, and tribal governments and consortia in the United States and Mexico was a board member and chair of the Good Neighbor Environmental Board, the US federal advisory dedicated to environmental infrastructure needs along the US-Mexico border. And she served the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine as a member of the Gulf Research Program Advisory Board. So welcome, Diana, real pleasure and honor to have you today. Um, uh, our other guest lecturer is Dr. Robin Bronin. She's a senior research scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and co-founder and works as the executive director of the Alaska Institute for Justice, a non-governmental organization that is the only immigration legal service provider in Alaska. Robin has worked as a human rights attorney and has been researching and working with communities forced to relocate because of climate change since 2007. She's worked with the White House Council on Environmental Quality to implement President Obama's Climate Change Task Force recommendations to address climate displacement, as well as the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in the Climate Change Office. So thank you, um, Robin, as well, for joining us today. And then Eva, I'm not sure if Eva's already on the call, but hopefully will be with us um, shortly. As our students know, Eva Don Burke is from the Denake and Lower Tanana Dene tribes. She's an MIT Solve Indigenous Communities Fellow Eva has a background in engineering and she's returned to her native roots after working in the oil and gas industry. Her graduate work at the uh, Alaska University Fairbanks is in natural resource management and she is studying sustainable agriculture and rural development. She's investigating healing through foods and cultures because she understands that the health of the land, animals and people are connected. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm sure Eva will join us shortly um, but we'll go ahead and get started. And I believe we're starting with um, Dr. Austin. So we'll turn the screen over to you. Thank you and welcome. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to share screen here. Okay, I think we're on. Uh, so first again, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, given that we have about 25 minutes or so, I'm going to present for about 15 to 20 minutes and then um, open up, uh, have questions. And I'm really not good at monitoring the chat while I present. So please put your questions in there and I'll come back to them. But I want to get through some basics. Uh, first of all, speaking of basics, Dr. Rule provided you all with a very excellent introduction to indigenous politics, governance, uh, framed in large part um, in the context of federally recognized tribes, and particularly also with reservations governed by federal and tribal laws. 
And Dr. Bronin is going to be discussing Alaska Native corporations and their legal structure. So I'm going to focus my discussion on non-federally recognized tribes and indigenous organizations, and looking especially at some of the special challenges that are facing U.S. Uh, regions that are home to indigenous people and communities who are not recognized by the federal government and whose land is owned and granted the same protections as laws governing the non-indigenous communities. Now, this is a huge topic, so I'm going to touch on some key points um, today. My goal is to give you some additional things to think about when you're working with indigenous peoples and communities in the U.S. Hopefully you'll find them relevant not only to uh, non-federally recognized tribes and organizations, but also to indigenous people who are not members of any tribe, but have indigenous ancestors and identify as indigenous, as well as to tribes who trace their origins to those same indigenous ancestors. Not surprisingly, there are multiple ways to understand identity and individuals and groups do sometimes disagree. Now there are 35 states that have federally recognized tribes within their borders. 13 states have formally recognized additional tribes as what we will call state recognized tribes. So um, to begin, this map um, originates as uh, the result of the Indian Claims Commission process. Um, the Indian Claims Commission Act of 1946 was a mechanism to resolve tribal claims against the US. That process ended in 1978, it established lands over which tribes were able to satisfy the US legal system that they had ties to these lands and that would obligate the federal government to compensate the tribes for what they had lost. Now, I'm not even going to get into what that compensation looked like, but the concept was to con compensate, but also to going forward to consultation with those tribes about federal activities taking place on these lands under certain circumstances. So the, these maps pop up if you're dealing with any actions on federal lands, often people will go back and start with the Indian Claims Commission map to identify which tribes might be um, involved in consultation. Now, first thing to note, it's a fraction of the land indigenous peoples controlled at the time of the European invasion. So a key point um, in and I'm zooming in here on the Southwest is to note all the white spaces on the land. And I draw your attention to this map because this feature is something you may recognize, that's the Colorado River. And it's important to note why there's so many white spaces. Any area that was contested by more than one group was not assigned to any group. And so you can see in some cases, the Southern Paiutes cross the Colorado River because they had land on both sides and Everybody agreed on that. All of this white space in between rivers or, or corridors for trade and interaction. So it's not surprising that more than one group claimed that area. All right, so important to think about uh, as we go back through um, is this is a quote by cultural anthropologist Alfred Lewis Kroeber and a reminder that Indian, American Indian nations, indigenous nations, again, this was back in 1955, but the concept is, is real. And that is that those indigenous nations and nationalities were converted into tribes, what we call tribes today, by a whole series of processes. And so the, and oftentimes the, the tribes don't overlap well. What, who is a tribe today? And particularly you can see from this map, this land these are the reservations that are left for Southern Paiutes from that huge territory that I showed you initially. And we'll talk a little more about this. Dr. Rule went through the mechanisms by which the federal government acknowledges tribes. So it's just a reminder, there were multiple ways in the past and some um, still available. She talked about the challenges of that and I will reinforce that here today. Now this map takes the um, Indian areas judicially established in 1978, and it overlays reservations. So you can see these black, and again, I put, I'm gonna zoom in in a minute, but you can see around here, these black outlines are existing reservations. All right, let's zoom back to the Southwest, and you can see there's not a nice overlap between the reservation. Some reservations are on the land 
that the tribe, the communities, the tribes were occupying at the time of European invasion, others are not. And so that adds another level of complexity. Uh, again, not only did the tribes lose a lot of land, but the varying sizes of today's reservations and the compositions don't simply map onto the organizations of indigenous groups uh, in the past, all right? And so again, working on federal lands, it's good to keep all of this in mind. This is again, I'm still on federally recognized tribes. In Arizona, there are 22 federally recognized tribes and 20 reservations. One advantage of this din density for the tribes in, in Arizona is that it gives them a certain degree of interaction and opportunities to organize together uh, and work on various issues at the state level. Here's an example, the Intertribal Council of Arizona, many states have intertribal councils, is composed of 21 tribal nations. And this is just a screenshot from their website, but gives you an idea if you look here at the current news, some of the issues that a group like this works on on behalf of its member tribes. So it's again, just another benefit uh, when you have a lot of tribes and largely these um, organizations are uh, federally recognized tribes. So I said I was gonna talk about non-federally recognized. With that context, let's zoom back out and look over here from a different perspective at all, all of this white area um, and where it is when you compare the West and the East and the Southeast, okay? Dr. Rule and other discussions you have had provide some explanation for all that white space on the map. Just reiterate, it does not mean there's no one there, but that no groups could establish sole claim to that territory. You see few federal re reservations. And so today I'm gonna focus on Louisiana as an example. All right, uh, Louisiana, as you can see on the map has four federally recognized tribes. They gained recognition somewhere between 1917 and 1981, all right? And as you can see on that map that Dr. Rule shared with you, by the time of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, Louisiana's indigenous peoples had already been so decimated, they were largely not visible to federal agents. So why is that the case? Just a little bit of background on Louisiana. Uh, they going all the way back to the late 1600s when the French came in and claimed the mouth of the Mississippi and entered the region. What you can see on here is not only was the decimation of groups like the Eastern Chittimacha very quick, um, but and, and happened over a, a fairly short period of time, but also this is it becomes recognized as a region of refuge. It's an area that uh, folks, not only Native Americans, but also Acadians, those were people who originated in French, came to, uh, it originated in France, came to Louisiana via Nova Scotia, wh who are known as the Cajuns, the Acadians. And so there are people coming into this region. Then you see we go back and forth between Spain and France, treaties between those two nations. Um, about who, who gets to acquire this territory until 1803 when the US purchases this territory from France. Now, notice that this is also at the time of the rise of the sugar industry. What this means is a rapid influx of Ang Anglo-Americans bringing African and African-American slaves. At this time, many, many landholders are displaced from valuable and productive land. Now, then there's an entire era that we could talk about civil war fascinating and very distressing things that happened during that period. One of the things that happens after the civil, in the post-war years is it actually sharpens this black white designation. And in the US census, there are several decades when there's actually no designation of Indian anymore. People are assigned either black or white. And I could give an entire talk just on that, but I'm gonna move on and let us think about just one group, the homeless. Um, and again, similar time frame to see this is from written records where we know homeless people were as they were being encountered by uh, folks like LaSalle, the French, who start into these regions. Now, this map here, I blow up to give you a little sense of, again, when I talk about regions of refuge, where people are headed. Up here, 
the West Feliciana Parish is north of Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge is actually the Homa in, in, in the Homa language means red stick. And so what you get is you get people moving down on the east bank they're encountered around New Orleans. Uh, bayous for folks who are not familiar are basically outlets from lakes and rivers that, and so you can see Bayou Lafouche comes off of um, the Mississippi River. The message of this slide is as more and more people are coming into this region, uh, folks are retreating and they're retreating into areas that are less populated. And that includes these areas um, down into the, the bayous. Bayous in, in federal law become defined as quote, uninhabitable swampland. So we've got this intermixing of how we perceive the environment and the people who are living there. But as I say, it becomes this place of refuge, but not only for Native Americans. I mentioned the Cajuns, but also runaway and freed slaves who moved down into this region. So you have a lot of mixing. Think back to what Dr. Rule talked to you about. Given this history, it's not surprising that the indigenous peoples and groups in this region were not visible to federal agents and certainly cannot meet the criteria for federal recognition, which Dr. Rule shared with you. All right, so another option. Okay, I'm sorry, just a picture of bayous give you a sense if you haven't um, seen and looked at bayous. Um, they're, you, they look uninhabitable until you get in there and the people who live there live there quite well, all kinds of adaptations um, to living there. So another option for some indigenous groups is state recognition. And I shared um, two documents I'm gonna to refer to a little bit uh, with you. The idea for state recognized tribes, first of all, state recognized tribes have existed since the end of the colonial period, all right? This is not a new concept and they've actually played an important role in policy development uh, with the, um, all the way back to the first tribe that we're aware of in state recognition in Connecticut in, in 1666. Okay, so this concept is not new. What I've done on this map is the yellow boxes represent the number of state recognized tribes. And I put this little map so you can kind of figure out, I'm not gonna go through how many every single tribe or every single state has, but to get you an idea again of look at where these are. Um, I've added the blue boxes. These are groups recognized here, three states in the West as by their states as having self-governing authority, but they don't have the same level of a like state resolution creating them as a tribe, okay? What's important to recognize though is that decisions about state recognition are made by the state. So therefore they're not consistent from one state to the next. Either why a tribe is recognized or the benefits that a state receives, that a tribe receives from the state as a result of, of being recognized as a state recognized tribe. So I shared with you the Senate, uh, the Louisiana Senate concurrent resolution as an example of why a state would recognize tribes. Now, for those who looked at that, and if you will just speak up, if because uh, I can't track everybody's uh, hands, somebody want to share from the perspective of Louisiana, they make it very clear in this resolution, why are they recognizing, not that they're be resolved, we'll get to that one in a minute, but why was Louisiana even venturing into recognizing these groups as tribes? Anybody? What did Louisiana get out of it? The state and its parishes, parishes are the equivalent of counties. Educational uh, I believe funding. Federal education funding. Exactly, money. It was the, this Louisiana, the, the, those regions, when the process happened that these groups left the United Home and Nation, all members, as said, it's a complicated situation. All members of, of the tribes that were seeking state recognition at that time were, had been members of the United Home and Nation. And so what happens is the, as, when they leave 
that state recognized tribe, that they lose access, this, the state can no longer count them as indigenous peoples. And so for that region, because a number of folks moved at the same time, and as a result of the ruling, as it explains in the resolution, um, of when for the United Home Nations seeking federal recognition, it has a monetary impact. And the, the answer was, let's go and um, propose state recognition to put to establish them back as tri as tribes. All right. Now, why I bring up this example from a policy point of view is what it's also doing is establishing two types of state recognition within one state. So Louisiana has the first recognition, which was of the Homas as an Indian community, and that started all the way back in 1977. With this process, now they are recognizing the Indian ancestry of the members of these groups. But notice they're very clear here in their therefore be it resolved that it is for the sole purpose of qualifying for Indian education and health care due to these citizens. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about what it is that state recognition does. OK, um, so there are material differences. As Dr. Rule talked about, federally recognized tribes yeah, have access to various types of resources, et cetera. State recognition, first of all, is a public acknowledgement of the historical and cultural connections of indigenous peoples to an area. And that in and itself is important and important for people to have acknowledged. But state recognition may also qualify the tribe or its members for federal and state support. And so there are actually four federal agencies, the US Department of Education, which we've mentioned, but also Housing and Urban Development, Labor, and Health and Human Services. They all have statutory and regulatory authority to provide for funding for state recognized tribes. Okay, here's the example from um, the US Department of Education, which we've discussed. Um, another point, the National Conference of State Legislatures points out that some states authorize tribal participation on state commissions. So even for state recognized tribes, they can serve on state commissions that typically make policy decisions affecting American Indians. So there's a value in state recognition, different um, than federal recognition for sure. Um, now, another value is that uh, depending again on the state and the community, state uh, recognized tribes may be also recognized by the federally recognized tribes. And I gave you the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation documentation as a you know, document as a way to think about how it is and in the circumstances in which federally recognized and state recognized tribes might work together. In Louisiana, they also have an intertribal council. It has the four federally recognized tribes and the United Home and Nation. Those are the only members and they've been members um, back, they started the organization back in 1975 at the time that the United Home Nation was the only state recognized tribe. Okay, so those are a couple of areas. I wanna to go to another one, just as planners and folks think about these things. Um, and that's the US Census. The US Census has established categories of tribal statistical areas. And you can see down to the level of literally the Oklahoma tribal statistical areas, but also these broader state designated tribal statistical areas. All right, now state designated tribal statistical areas are identified and delineated by the state for the purposes of getting statistical data for a geographical area that encompasses a large portion of members of the state recognized tribe. Okay, so let's go to a map. Actually, the underlying map Dr. Rule had as part of her presentation, this is actually a map um, that the purple areas, you notice the green areas show tribal lands. The purple areas are actually these state designated um, statistical areas. And I use the United Home Nation again as an example to look the 
area that I've circled is what is known as the United Home Nation Service Area, and it's made up of six parishes. And you can see that basically the state identified those exact areas. If you look down here, this purple on the map, and you were to trace those six parishes, that's exactly that area. And so that's where it came from. Okay, that's a whole lot of information in a short amount of time. I promised you it would be complicated and it is. All right, my goal here was to continue the process that Dr. Rule began, which was to complicate the idea of indigeneity and to give you some framework for thinking about those groups outside of federally recognized tribes and some persisting for, for have been around for very long times having come to be state recognized or indigenous groups that are not state recognized but are that are on lists and are, are identify themselves as indigenous groups to get a sense of again just how complicated this can be and to end with just some things to get us thinking about and then as i said to turn to questions um so you're working with uh, tribal communities, indigenous communities. What do you do? How do you get enough background to even get going? And first of all, I always recommend now that everybody's in the internet world, start with the tribe's homepage. You get approached or you find out a project is gonna involve tribes, get some background from the tribe's perspective. They created their websites. They are putting out what they want you to understand. Contact their tribal office for tribally sanctioned histories. Many tribes have gone through and looked at various histories that were written throughout the period of settler uh, colonialism, and they have identified ones that they do not want, they don't refer to and don't support. They were done without anybody in the tribe having any say in what was written. And so it's good to get an idea from the tribe. How do they understand their history. But it's also important because of all of these things that we've been talking about to gather information on the other tribes in the area and the relationships among tribes. So you just have a sense of how has this evolved over time so you recognize where you might be bumping up against some challenges as groups reorganize or, or attempting recognition may have not um, achieved recognition, et cetera. And another um, source is the state's inner tribal council, which can give you some information as well. There are many other groups. This is just to get the idea of getting started, of doing some work and understanding who you're working with as you go forward. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm actually gonna stop sharing so I can see you. And I don't know how much time we have. I know we start a little bit late, um, but hopefully a few, little bit of time for some questions uh, from the group. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Austin. It is such a complicated subject, but really appreciate the additional layers of nuance that you've provided. Do we have some questions from the students? And maybe what we could do is if people could turn their cameras on. I know sometimes it's challenging um, with your bandwidth, but if it's possible for the discussion, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, Osamu, please. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm the TA for the class. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you mentioned that tribes um, or nations were kind of amalgamated together into tribes and that didn't necessarily fall along the actual lines of kind of existing cultures. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of conflicts that that created, if you're, if you're aware. Sure. Um, there are a number of tribes where you can look and see an example being the Colorado River Indian tribes in Arizona. They actually have members from four different indigenous groups who when they were established as a tribe and I, I should have put a map, I should have anticipated that question. If you look at that group, you have um, Chimawavi and Mojave people. You also have Hopis and Navajos who are not close. And you would say, how is it that you ended up with some, some individuals from those groups all created into the Colorado River Indian tribes? Uh, you, this is a case you go across the US and you can find groups like this. And how did that happen? As the federal government was moving to put tribes on reservations, they were trying to reduce the number of 
places they were going to put tribes. I have done work with the Southern Paiutes for several decades and um, they're an example. You saw from the map the little tiny dots all over the place. There were efforts to try to bring all the Paiutes together in one place and they failed. They tried to actually put the Paiutes on the Ute reservations in Colorado. Well, the, the Paiutes and the Utes um, at, the, at that time were not um, in, in uh, should we say on speaking terms, um, Utes had been capturing Paiutes and selling them into slavery um, in, in, with the Span for the Spanish. And so the Paiutes were not happy to be placed on reservations with the Utes. And so they kept leaving and disappearing. And so what you end up eventually is these number of executive order reservations that are created for the Paiutes. So in that case, they're mostly Paiutes, but very much reduced from the number. But that's an example of where there was an effort to try to put them all together on the same reservation. And that didn't work out. In some, from force, from military action, uh, they were forced to stay. People would leave reservations and were taken, you know, dragged back uh, or killed. So that there's there was a whole process. Again, the idea of creating the reservations was to reduce. Um, largely, it was done, and and if you look at at the the movement west in terms of establishing reservations to continue to make way for. Uh, white settlers to be able to take over that area. And so as they came, it'd be like round up and move people out of the, you know, move the indigenous peoples out of the way so that other people could come in. And so you see this happens uh, across the country and at different points in time. Any other questions or thoughts or? Yeah, Disha, please. Can I ask a little bit about the consultation process that was outlined in one of the readings that you shared? Um, I know that there were really specific sorts of pieces of language attached to when non-federally recognized tribes could be engaged in the process at, by invitation, um, uh, only when there were particular issues that might pertain um, their histories or cultures. And I was wondering if you could provide examples of what that looks like in implementation. Um, if you had experience with that, that seems no, that's a great question. Um, and yes, I've had some experience with that. Of uh, there are a number of Southern Paiute tribes. I showed the num you know, they broke up in small groups, but there's one group, the Pahrump um, Paiute tribe, which is not federally recognized. And so it's an example of, but the it's recognized by Paiutes. And so they acknowledge and recognize them. It's different, a very different situation than the situation I described in Louisiana, where uh, the, the groups were mixed very much so by the time people are starting to identify um, and, and go for federal recognition. In this case, the Pahrumps were just, it's a small community and they never achieved recognition as a separate tribe. But all the other Paiutes, it wasn't like they didn't withdraw from any other group. They, the other Paiutes recognized them as being Paiute. And so when um, there's an, a, a consultation, uh, we've done work to um, the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology or BARA where I work um, with the Department of Energy, for instance, on activities at the Nevada test site. And the other federally recognized tribes say, bring in Pahrump, um, they should be part of this process as well. So that's one way that, that a state recognized or a non-recognized tribe will get in is because the other groups recognize them and recognize um, as in the document I shared, there are some groups that are not federally recognized be as a statement. They have chosen not to um, make the claim that the federal government has that kind of authority over them. So you get, it, the, again, a lot of that process happens depending on what the discussion is. The um, reading mentioned under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, oftentimes because groups do not lay claim to ancestors that are not theirs. And so if they go in and they might be brought in on a consultation because of um, some, an agency looked on or a museum or a group that's, that's managing the repatriation and said, you have affiliation with the land on which these remains were found. The groups will work among themselves and, that, and there are times where they will say that should go to a non-recognized group because that's, it's, those are their ancestors. 
So oftentimes you'll get um, the, the groups working together, but recognizing that that's not always the case. Sometimes there's contention about whether that group should be recognized, is recognized, uh, if there's especially in tribes that have been moved far from their homelands, there were maybe groups that are identifying there as, um, as indigenous uh, tribes, but the group that is federally recognized content is, you know, contends that uh, or contests that. So then there's usually a process. Um, we started and Professor Suskin mentioned his work in, you know, being that media arbiter and mediator, that's often where it comes to somebody is trying to understand how to meet with and get perspectives of different groups. But fundamentally, there are, you know, there are certain processes where unless a tribe is federally recognized, there's no requirement to bring them in. So oftentimes it is other groups or the state or somebody else who will say they need to be brought in as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Austin, thanks so much. I wonder if I could just ask one question. It's not in the talk, but if you could say um, a bit more about the Oklahoma, the recent Supreme Court case, the McGirt case, and what, how that is changing the landscape and what the implications of that might be. Well, that is a case that caused me to have to go back and read again about census, you know, the, the role the census plays in these areas. And that is, you know, looking at areas that have been designated at various points in time as being Indian land. And so I don't want to pretend I'm an expert on that case at all. I have had nothing other than reading the same as, as others to look and try to follow what's going on. I uh, have done some work in Oklahoma in the past, but I'm not recently working with any groups there. But essentially what happens there is if we say these areas that uh, like that census map that shows all of these um, tribal designated areas that we now say these actually um, believe, you know, belong to or, or tribes have a right to claim them you saw there are, there are a lot of areas that people have not seen and have not been separated out um, as being specifically reservations. So it, it potentially has huge implications. I know that's a very short, um, not very satisfying answer. Um, I think a lot of people are gonna be watching to see how, you know, what, what actually happens there. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um... Dr. Austin. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Robin and Eva, who's joined us. Before we do that, Eva, we, we inter had, had a chance for everybody to do um, a quick overview and introduction. Is there anything you wanted to say to the group? Even in addition to the students, we have um, potentially a few individuals from our department joining as well, and, and then several individuals have requested recordings. So they'll see this talk after the fact. Um, I could just say good morning. Um, I'm gonna just Robin with a little bit of um, on the ground impacts of climate change, especially on our food resources and some of the regulations that uh, make it harder for us in Alaska to harvest our traditional foods. Um, an, an example of some food insecurity. And I, I cannot join by video today. I am having real internet uh, problems in Alaska. So, and I'm in Fairbanks. So that's what's really funny. I'm in the urban center and I have internet problems. So yes, that, that's our reality up here. So good All morning. Right. It's morning here, so good morning. Yes, they, it's very early morning. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Ethan. All right, Robin. We'll let you um, share your screen if you're able for your slides and, and then we'll have time for discussion with our three speakers after the presentations. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for this invitation to talk to all of you. And first I wanna acknowledge that I I do my work, my office is on the unceded lands of the Domina and uh, who have been stewards of these lands for thousands of years. And it is a privilege and honor for me that I get to do the work that I do there. 
And I also want to acknowledge that my fabulous coworker is also on the line, former coworker, I should say, Anouk Olin, who is an MIT graduate student in the Endangered Indigenous Languages Program. So good morning, Anouk. And um, the heart of what I'm going to talk today, I know uh, it was about in your syllabus, Alaska Native Law, and then uh, there was a mention about corporations. And what I really want to do is talk about decolonization um, in the context of the climate crisis. So I, I am going to talk very briefly about land issues in Alaska um, as one of the ways that colonization continues to undermine the sovereignty of tribes and then shift gears to talk about the work that we're doing at the Alaska Institute for Justice to decolonize these systems as the climate crisis is forcing Alaska Native communities to make this awful, awful decision about uh, the need to relocate their communities. So this is a language map. Of Robin, I'm sorry, just to interrupt real yeah. quick. There's um, the sound, I think when you turn your head like kind of up and away from the computer, it, it um, dramatically drops down in volume. So I know this is kind of challenging, but just if you could kind of speak down into the, the mic, I think that might keep the, the audio at the same level. Thank you. And I know there, yes, that's the problem with my internet connection. Is this better? Yeah, okay, cool. So I, uh, I'm gonna start this presentation by this map of Alaska, which shows the 20 language groups uh, of Alaska. And this map is important because, um, you know, these boundaries are based on languages. There's not boundaries based on land ownership, although there were traditional uses of lands within these boundaries, um, but they weren't uh, formally, um, what I would say um, that impacted the, the migration of peoples. And so um, historically, Alaska Native communities have migrated between the lands on which they harvest food. So there were fish camps in the summertime and, uh, and then camps in the winter. And uh, during the 20th century, the uh, US federal government forced Alaska Native communities to become sedentary, to fix their communities in one location because of the federal requirement that children needed to be in school. And the locations of these schools, uh, so the schools had to be built, and the location of these schools were determined by where barges could drop off construction materials. And so it's really important to understand um, when I'm going to talk about the climate crisis that these fixed permanent settlements are relatively new for Alaska Native populations. And it's because of the requirement that they be in these permanent settlements that they are now faced with this really difficult decision about relocating this fixed infrastructure that has um, provided schools and healthcare clinics and power utilities and in some communities, water and sewage lagoons. Um, so there are no roads to get to many Alaska Native communities. The only way that you can get to uh, a lot of the tribes is by getting in Plains from Anchorage or Fairbanks. Um, and usually they're very small 10 seater planes. And this all changed um, during the, uh, so um, this all changed when um, the Al Alaska became a state in the United States. And um, the Treaty of Session in 1867 was the first time that the US federal government in theory took possession of these lands from Russia. Um, it is usually contested whether Russia had any ability to sell the lands of Alaska to the US federal government. Um, and then in 1959, there was a vote um, within the state of Alaska about whether or not to become a state and 
the decision was to become a state. I, I often like to note that at that time when the vote was happening for the uh, whether or not Alaska would become a state to the United States, election materials were not translated into any of the indigenous languages that I showed you on that first screen. And it took two lawsuits, uh, which recently happened during this century, to force the Alaska state government to translate election materials. So in my mind, there's real question about the validity of that election. Of course, we are a state of the United States, but when we're now when we're talking about voter suppression laws and the, the consequence, of not having people impacted by these laws being able to vote, there's a dramatic impact. And then um, you can see on the bottom of this slide that um, after the Treaty of Session and after the state of Alaska became a state, there were no decisions that really impacted native Aboriginal lands, meaning it was still undecided about tribal sovereignty tribal governments and their jurisdiction over the lands that they had used for harvesting foods and living for millennia. And it wasn't until uh, 1971 when the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was passed where, um, and I actually, I hate saying this because it's such an awful consequence in my mind that Aboriginal land title was extinguished. And a corporate structure was created to take possession of these Aboriginal lands with um, 13 regional corporations, 12 of them in Alaska, and then 224 village corporations. And they acquired 44 million acres of land. Um, and then they were compensated by uh, $962 million, $962 million or the lands that they relinquished in this process. Um, one of the big issues that um, is still, I think, being litigated, and I, what, what I mean by that is tribal sovereignty. There was a question for a very long time as to whether the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which created this corporate structure, how that interfaced with tribal governments and tribal sovereignty. And so, um, and the state of Alaska, I would say, did everything possible and continues to challenge tribal sovereignty and tribal government uh, self-determination. So um, it wasn't until 2000 that the state of Alaska finally acknowledged that tribes did exist in Alaska. There are 229 federally recognized tribes so the federal government recognized tribal sovereignty before the state government did. And tribal sovereignty is still litigated all the time in regard to what that means in relationship to the state government. Specifically, uh, a lot of the litigation has involved family law issues and then taxation issues. So it's created a very, very complicated colonial structure of uh, land title and tribal sovereignty that um, has impacted how tribes navigate these uh, very complex jurisdictional issues. And this is a map um, of all the different land title uh, in Alaska. And so you can see that, um, so the Green areas are the lands that are owned uh, and managed by the federal government. And the federal government in Alaska actually owns 60% of the land. And then uh, the next largest landholder in the state of Alaska is the state of Alaska. Um, and then uh, a much smaller portion are the lands owned by Alaska Native peoples, either through corporations or through native allotments. And it's important, I mean, I, I, uh, if you think about that first slide that I showed, which laid out the, the way that tribal communities based on their language groups were situated within this land mass. And you look at it now in regard to how complex jurisdictional issues are with all these different 
uh, ownership titles, it's made it really, really difficult for um, the communities that have made the decision to relocate to actually make the decision to relocate to lands within the lands that they have title to. And so I know that um, you've already talked about climate change and I wanna talk about it though in the Arctic context because it's really important to understand that in the Arctic, the land, uh, the temperatures are rising twice as fast as the lower latitudes and uh, at dramatic consequence for the land and ocean. And so you can see these maps, um, which are showing uh, the temperature increases, which have been as high as uh, seven degrees Celsius above the norms. And I show these pictures because they're taken, uh, these temperature anomalies are happening during the winter time where in the Arctic, the sun isn't shining. So we're having these extreme temperature increases at a time when we think of warmth coming from the sun, the sun isn't even above the horizon. And that, uh, and a lot of the warmth is happening over Greenland and the Greenland ice sheet, which is causing exacerbated melting of not only the Greenland ice, ice sheet, but the Arctic Ocean. And so um, there are dramatic impacts to the land. Arctic sea ice has been decreasing dramatically uh, over the last 20 years, with the last 14 years being the lowest uh, of the uh, extent, the minimum extent, which is uh, measured during the September. The lowest minimum extents have been during the last 14 years. And the loss of Arctic sea ice is dramatic because Arctic sea ice is the natural barrier for coastal communities on the north and west coast of Alaska that protect these communities from uh, the storms that traditionally have happened in the fall. We don't get hurricanes in Alaska, at least not yet, um, but we do get hurricane strength winds. And without that Arctic sea ice, you can see on this photo on, I think the right of your screen, where you can see dramatic um, land loss. And through the work that Anouk and I did with uh, the tribes in Alaska, we identified a, um, a new natural hazard. And new, what I mean by new is state and federal government agencies weren't recognizing that uh, catastrophic land collapse, Ustek was happening. The way that it has been defined has been talking about erosion and erosion uh, does not describe the severity of land collapse happening, particularly on the coastal part of Alaska, although Ustek is also happening in the interior. And Ustek is caused by the combination of thawing permafrost erosion and flooding. So the heart of our work has been on this issue of planned community relocation. And I mention this because um, it's really important to define what community relocation is in the context of what's happening in Alaska. So in Alaska, there are three Alaska Native communities that have made this decision that they need to relocate their community because the land is no longer habitable for them because of what I've just described in regard to Ustek. And while three Alaska Native communities have made the decision to relocate, only the community of Mutok is actually in a process of relocating. So when I talk about planned relocation, the first part is that it must be voluntary. And what that means is that the right to self-determination, tribal self-determination must be protected. And the reason why this is so critically important is because um, as uh, Dr. Rule described and Dr. Austin described, the US government has an awful history of relocating indigenous populations. Um, and at horrific consequence. And the most recent forcible relocation occurred in Alaska during World War II 
when the Unungan people on the Aleutian Island were relocated to Southeast Alaska. So protecting that right to self-determination is absolutely critical. The other piece that's really, really important is that communities need to be in the places that they call home in order to ensure that their right to self-determination can be protected. Because when people are uh, displaced because of extreme weather events, the ability to protect that right to self-determination can be compromised because of the humanitarian crisis. Um, of needing to provide food, shelter, and water to people who are displaced. And then in thinking about this as a long-term process, because relocation is a really big deal. It's not just about infrastructure, it's mostly about people and making sure people can survive and thrive in the places that they are relocating to. And I always emphasize that the protection of human rights is the most important piece to this, that people have the right to food and water and adequate housing. And that when you're building all homes and rebuilding homes and infrastructure, that you are always thinking about ensuring that the human rights of people are, connect, are protected. And then you're maintaining your social and kinship connections. Um, this is, uh, these are photos of the community of New Talk uh, that I mentioned earlier. And I was part of an MIT uh, workshop that occurred a couple of years ago with J Janelle and Osamu when tribal members from the community of New Talk came along with Ilde Jean Charles to talk about the relocation issue. And you can see by these photos the dramatic land loss that has occurred because of the climate crisis. The other piece that's important to understand is that um, the tribal government made the decision to relocate about 25 years ago. And they recognized um, their tribal elders knowing the land around where their permanent community. So this is a community that was forcibly settled in the late 1950s, early 1960s they began looking for other sites that would be able to withstand the climate crisis. And the land that they found was about nine miles across the Ninglick River on land that was owned by Fish and Wildlife. So if you show, if you remember that slide that I showed previously with that, what I, a really complex map of land ownership in Alaska, the native village of Newtok had to hire a lobbyist to lobby Congress. So they had been in negotiations with Fish and Wildlife for years. And Fish and Wildlife, in my mind, kept coming up with reasons why they couldn't just do a land exchange with the native corporations. So they were being um, incredibly resistant to doing the land exchange, which required then the native village of Newtok to hire a lobbyist and lobby Congress and this whole process took eight years. And it wasn't until 2003 that the land was actually exchanged. And so this is really concerning for other communities that are needing to think about relocation and where they're going to be able to relocate to. Because given how quickly the climate crisis is accelerating, a lot of communities are not going to have those eight years to wait for a congressional enactment. And the important, other important thing to understand is that of the 300 and approximately 50 people living in New Talk, only 120 of them were actually able to go to their relocation site and be relocated uh, in 2019. Two thirds of the community still live in that, in the community that you can see the photograph of from October, 2016. And there's no timeline. Uh, government agencies will tell you there is no timeline for when the remaining members of this community will be able to be safe. And you can see that I've, I've already mentioned there are no evacuation roads. So when extreme weather events happen, there's no place for them to go to higher ground. So there are four major governance issues in relationship to this issue. And I put this in the context of how Anouk and I, working with the tribes, tried to decolonize the systems that are oppressing communities. 
that are preventing them from implementing their community-based adaptation strategies. So there's no government agency in the United States. There's no legislation that decides who makes the decision that relocation needs to occur. There's no government agency in the United States that has the funding or mandate to facilitate a relocation when communities make that decision. There's no determination about when a community should think that relocation needs to occur to start that planning process. And then there's no guidelines about how you actually facilitate a relocation effort with tribes being front and center to making that happen. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, protecting the human rights of uh, and sovereignty of tribal citizens is absolutely critical. There's no human rights document that actually uh, directly addresses this, although the human rights that need to be protected are included in a lot of UN recognized um, human rights documents, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and uh, the Universal Declaration of Uni uh, Human Rights. And as I said and keep saying, the right to self-determination is the most important human right to protect, to make sure that tribes are in control of all decisions affecting whether, when, and how they relocate. And so in uh, this Last slide, uh, you know, the decolonization of systems. I just want to give you an example of how Anouk and I worked with the tribes to decolonize the systems that are causing these communities that we work with to be environmentally vulnerable. Hazard mitigation planning is part of um, FEMA, the federally, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency system. It is part of their process to enable communities to um, identify the hazards in their community, identify the things that need to be done to mitigate those hazards. It needs to be approved by FEMA. Um, these plans need to be approved by FEMA in order for then communities to get access to the technical assistance and funding they need. Hazard mitigation planning, so many Alaska Native communities have not only a tribal government, but a city government. And depending on if you are in the tribal government or city government, you have different access to different resources. So the city government can work through the state to do a hazard mitigation plan. The state then decides who is going to do the hazard mitigation plan in your community. So the tribe or the, the city has no control over who that consultant will be coming into your community, not knowing your community. They only come in for two or three days. And then the tribe uh, is often left out. They may be included in the meetings, but they're not the prime uh, governing entity working with the state to develop their hazard mitigation plan. In, I believe it was 2013, tribes then, because tribes have a government to government relationship with the federal government, they became able to do tribal hazard mitigation plans directly with FEMA without, without having to go through the state. So in communities where there is a city and a tribal government, it becomes extraordinarily complex in regard to who is going to do hazard mitigation planning Will they be working together because the city and the tribe may or may not be working together to address these issues within their community? And, um, and so in doing this work with the tribes, we identified there is the ability to do multi-hazard jurisdiction plans where you, um, the tribe and the city work together in order to create these plans so that their entire community is able to be involved in the process of identifying the hazards and then identifying what needs to happen to mitigate them. And so with the tribes, we, and working with city governments also, we were able to identify for FEMA the way that they needed to address hazard mitigation planning to ensure that the, the tribe and the city working together, if there was a city government, that they were the ones making the decisions about 
who was coming into their community to do these plans. Now, state and federal government haven't yet adopted these recommendations from the tribes because there's more advocacy that needs to be done. But that's just an example of how we have been trying to decolonize these systems that have made it extraordinarily difficult for tribes to work with the city governments within their communities and then to get access to the resources that they need. And on this other part of the slide, you can see the governance framework that we have been trying to implement where you're in a continuum of responses with protecting communities and the places where they are is the most important thing to do before determining whether or not relocation needs to occur and using community-based environmental monitoring where communities are doing the monitoring with state and federal government technical experts to understand what the predicted rates of environmental change are so that they can make these decisions before Ustek happens and destroys critical infrastructure in their community that will make it really, really difficult for them to remain where they are. And these are the incredible community members that uh, Anouk and I have had the honor to work with um, doing this work. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Bronin. Tremendous information provided and really appreciate the, the new terminology that you've developed as well to describe what's happening. Um, Eva, did you want to say a few words about this as well? Yes. Um, how much time do you want me to spend? About five or 10 minutes? Yeah, I think that sounds good. And then we can save a little bit of time at the end for, for the discussion. Okay. I'm gonna, I had a PowerPoint. I'm going to go through it really quickly. Okay. Because I feel like that, that would be very helpful. Yep. All right. To actually go to the home. So I just wanted to talk about um, really a couple of things here is there right now, uh, like Robin was saying, we have a lot of changes to our environment because of climate change. And so let me minimize that. And so you see here in the, some of these were the major events that were experienced in Alaska, really related to record heat, uh, low uh, thin ice conditions on river we travel on the river so that's a big problem for us um, drought uh, many of you may have heard of the marine heat wave that was in the gulf of alaska the pacific ocean as well um, the low sea ice you know that that also impacts the states the sea the melting sea ice and so you know alaska is not alone in the felt impacts of climate change and if you guys just recall, Houston just got dumped on with a bunch of snow and that's, it's a changing environment. Uh, when the sea ice melts, it creates a lot more precipitation, which we're experiencing in Alaska right now. Um, and these are, you know, billions of dollars in cost to respond to these. Um, and so this is an example of some of the other issues that the other states are going through right now. And then what does this mean for us? For us, it's a real change on our traditional foods. Uh, we have a picture of the, you know, the sea ice melts, new species are moving north. They're chasing the cooler water temperatures. Uh, so we're starting to see impacts to our whales. We're starting to see impacts to walrus haulouts, uh, seals, seabird die-offs um, in 2019 we had one of the hottest years on records with the lowest water levels. So we had uh, shallow water on the Yukon with very, very warm air temperatures that resulted in salmon floating up dead. And when people went out to cut open the salmon, they were perfectly fine. It was just like, there was no sign of disease. It was definitely related to heat. Um, so they're still studying that type of stuff right now too. And then, you know, over the years, this is what's been happening to our salmon. Uh, they've been getting smaller and less in number. 
So, and I, I actually have pictures of this, which I forgot to put in here, of my grandmother's catching salmon that are, were very, very large um, and uh, plenty, which we just don't have that anymore. And so, and I really think that commercial, commercialization of our food resources um, plays a big role in this. As you can see, this is the uh, harvest that the state of Alaska has reported um, over the past century. And you can see that it was a little more sustainable up until about um, statehood. And then after, right um, in the 70s and 80s, you see a huge increase in commercial fishing, but you also see a huge increase in hatchery fish. Um, and what does that eventually mean? It, it means that we're having an abundance of like hatchery fish of the pinks, but the fish that we rely on and that we prefer are the Chinook, the king salmon. So right here, one Alaska king salmon is worth the same as two barrels of oil right now. So that's a pretty big statement and that it, we should all be concerned about that. Um, and I just wanted to show a little bit about you know, last year during COVID, the people of Alaska were trying to get emergency food hunts, which the state would not even respond to. But if there is this article that just came out a couple of days ago about big game, big money, a raffle designed to boost fish and game. Fish and game says we lost out on over $2 million of revenue and that's their permit fees. So the state of Alaska missed, uh, missed out on $2 million in revenue because COVID shut down all the hunting, the, the out-of-state hunters that come up here. And so if you look at some of the people that are involved in this hunt, they're one hunter per guide, $24,500. So if you're an out-of-state hunter, you can hire these people to take you out. And you'll have to because nobody can travel across Alaska unless you have some type of local knowledge. I mean, and it gets even worse. Look at the, some of these prices for um, moose, brown bear, and wolf, where they do a combo hunt. That's thirty-four thousand five hundred dollars. That's a lot of money for the big, um, big game guides. Which we do have some of our Alaska natives are guides, but predominantly those guides are going to be non-native. And this is what the aftermath of some of the guide hunts looks like. As you can see their priority and focus, their value is on the corn, the horns, the sheep curls right here. Um, so the, they go after the antlers, but they tend to waste the meat. This is a picture of a caribou head uh, washing up on the banks. And over here is a picture of caribou meat wasted in the dump. Uh, my friend actually salvaged four caribou out of the dump right here and brought me some meat out of it. It's still perfectly good. It's just not something that they prefer to eat. They're really in it for the thrill of the hunt. And so I, I wanted to add a couple of slides in here about this, but I am going to have to move through them pretty quickly. Um, we can go back to this that you guys can, I'll, I can share this presentation. But on these different levels of self-governance and uh, you know, really truly sovereignty, it, it, we are mostly in these three bottom categories where we're on advisory committees. Um, consultation occurs a little bit, but not all the way. <laughs> um, and then on management boards, you know, we, we are training people to serve in these management capacities right now, but we're still very much at an advisory committee level, which we meet in each region and we provide uh, like um, recommendations to these management boards, which is gonna be Board of Game, Board of Fish. We do have a couple indigenous people on these management boards, but the majority is non-native. So you'll have like 10, not 10 people on the board, two of whom might be Alaska native. And there's usually one of them is a, a big game hunter. So there's a conflict of interest in that too. Um, and then here we have the dual management. How does this come about? The, it depends on where the lands are. If you're on federal lands, uh, these lands listed right here on the left, the, B, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is the management board for that. 
if you're on state lands, it's or regional corporation lands, private lands, the state of Alaska is the management board on that. So that's very confusing to, and you know, Alaska, it's not like we, it looks, it's very wild. So you don't know when you're out there whose land you're on unless you're carrying a GPS unit. So and like I was mentioning, we're starting to see this division between the federal government and state government. On some cases, some of them, they're working together and others are not. During COVID, the community of Cake organized to do a hunt to uh, hunt a couple of deer and moose that they were going to share within the community. This was during COVID when up here in Alaska, 95% of our food is flown in by plane. And so the grocery store shelves were literally empty and these uh, subsistence resources were really needed. And so it, this court case has been going on um, for a period of time throughout 2020. And the federal government authorized a hunt, which the state of Alaska, uh, which is Dunleavy, our governor is Dunleavy, he objected to this hunt. Um, and which is really problematic. And, but the federal government held up the fact that these people have the right to hunt and fish in times of emergency. So I think what's, what's really important here is it's the values around the foods. When you're talking about the size of the salmon on the bottom left, I literally was only getting like a few salmon at a time compared to at least when you check a net on the river, you should be getting somewhere between 10 and 20. And we were getting somewhere between like maybe one, three or five. Uh, the values that it is, it's, it's more than food. It's a cultural connection. It's intergenerational learning. Uh, this is a picture of me teaching my son how to cut fish. This first fish that I caught, I hadn't fished for 30 years at our fish camp. And this first fish I gave to an elder, Luke Titus here in the middle. And then some people from Ninana that, uh, you know, we're always learning and always teaching. And these, uh, this is um, one of our elders teaching his son about the right way to cut fish. This type of cut right here is half dried, which we like to put up in the smokehouse for a day or two. And then you put it in the oven. It is the best soul food ever. You cannot do this with anything but king salmon in my mind. And you know, so um, like Robin was saying, we have to advocate and there's healing for everybody in this. You know, when I did my MIT work and we were talking about our indigenous values, the lady in there uh, coming from a philanthropist background was, you know, moved saying, you know, this is something that I, I, I wasn't aware of. This is something that you know, usually in presentations, I just zone out. She goes, but when I hear this, it really moves me and it really wants me to help the people that are experiencing this type of stuff. So it's our job to advocate. And I think food and health justice is really something that I work in because the health of the land, the health of the animals, the health of the people, they're all connected. And, you know, if you look at Alaska Native people, we have some of the higher health disparities, uh, but everybody's food system has been colonized. Uh, Alaska Natives are not the only people suffering from diabetes and heart disease and obesity. Uh, it, it's a nationwide problem. So this want to end with that note that we're, you know, it's not just us that are suffering from the colonization of our food systems. So I had to go through that pretty quickly. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'll let you start with um, maybe Robin and then I can. Thank you so much, Eva. It is really, um, really wonderful to see that perspective and understand also what the challenges that we often see from um, a much, much bigger macro lens look like on the ground. And then also just the, the economics of the food resources as well, really kind of shocking to think about how those resources are used in the state versus um, how they, they should be used. So let's open it up. We don't have that much time left in class, but I'd like to open it up to for questions for, for Dr. Bronin, for Eva, um, and for Dr. Austin, who's still on the call.
Maybe I could just start with one one question for you, uh, Robin, about the maps of of, of um, the language maps that you showed at the beginning, and you know the traditional boundaries of those communities, and that for for whatever reason that map stopped at the Russian border. Could you say something about kind of how people in Alaska relate across different scales? What is you know the connection across the Arctic? Um, how do they think about sovereignty or, or uh, uh, tribal identity across their local, the, the national and the, the supranational scales? Well, Ava or Anouk may be better able to answer it honestly than I can. I, honestly, I mean, what I can share is that the Inuit Circumpolar Council is about the Inuit Accord across the Arctic. Um, and there's tremendous advocacy that is done on all levels of government, international, national, and uh, within our state. And then there's the Arctic Council. So um, there are a permanent participant representation, which are indigenous communities of the Arctic Council, um, which includes the governments, the national nation state governments of the Arctic. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would defer to Ava or Anouk um, to more fully answer that question than I was able to. I can add a piece too. Um, like she was mentioning, for food security, we have uh, up here at UAF, we have the International Arctic Research Center. And there is a Arctic Observing Summit that many of us go to. So we have a food security working group here and we span the entire Arctic uh, circle. So from Russia to Alaska, to Canada, to Greenland, over to Norway. So we do meet and discuss the issues and share um, stories and knowledge. So that's an, like something that's actively going on. Maybe Anouk, you might have some other thoughts too. Sure. So. Um... It was last year or two years ago, we had the Inuit Circumpolar Council General Assembly where indigenous peoples from Russia, Canada, and Greenland came together. Um, and we meet to share our, our cultures and ways of life, but we also work together to manage um, different political, social, economic issues that impact all of us. Um, so, yeah, if, if interested about, about our international work, um, ICC is a good place to start. Um, on a personal level, I, my mom grew up having co regular correspondence with indigenous people from Russia. Um, and that eventually inspired me to learn Russian um, when I was in college. And I really think learning languages um, helps to strengthen our connections um, to other peoples um, around the world. And using language for me is, is a way of, of strengthening relationships. So that's what I'd like to add. Thank you, Anouk. Um, Larry? Yes, first, let me thank all of you. Uh, there's not been a presentation like that in our department. I'm in our department 50 years. I know how we teach about planning and how it's changed. And uh, there are just so many important things that you've raised that for me, um, say that our emphasis should be focused on futures, not, I mean, yes, you learn from the past, but our emphasis should be focused on very different futures. Uh, on the one hand, the materials you presented suggest that very major transformations are possible over time in the United States in the way in which sovereignty, land use, cultural control uh, play out. They haven't gone in the directions that we all might advocate, but it is possible for major changes to occur. And so 
if we want to be thinking about futures, alternative futures, given where we are, not, not, not just from a clean sheet of paper, given where we are, should we be thinking about the dismantling the structure of the corporations? Should we be thinking about all new boundaries that resurrect some cultural lines? Should, I mean, if, if something radical could be imagined, I'm not arguing we need to know the political strategy for achieving it, but what, what with Robin, especially with the, what you've been doing all this time, what do you imagine an ideal future is to work toward? Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, I'm not indigenous, so it's not my place. Um, and, and what I would share is, um, and I repeat, it's like the decolonization is critical. And, um, you know, my, my uh, background is primarily as a lawyer. And, um, you know, law is not exempt from how law has been used as a tool of colonization. And the reason why I say that is because it is critically important for each of our disciplines to understand how our discipline has one been embedded with racism and two has promoted colon the ongoing colonization. And so in directly answering your question, you know, what the, uh, so first relocation and the forcible displacement of people is awful. Like it's just, I need to say it is awful. And the opportunity to revision what relationship to land and each other are, is the opportunity. And it will only come by really, really looking at the systems that need to be decolonized and placing the right to self-determination where it has always been and needs to continue to be so that the people, and I'll talk about Alaska, so that the tribes in Alaska can vision for themselves what that future opportunity is um, because it's going, it's, we, we're just on the cusp of radical change. And so the relationship between land is going to change as a result of the land on which people have been living is disappearing and transforming. Right. Anouk do you, or Ava, do you have anything to add? I just wanted to add, Rob, in terms of taking responsibility, when I first arrived at MIT in the late 1960s, they were very proud of the fact that Alaska's first head of state land use planning was a graduate of our department, Victor Fisher. And um, for a very long time, uh, everyone pointed to the fact that, well, this is wonderful. A graduate of our department is in charge for the first time of all, trying to lay out how land and land planning should happen in the state. Um, I would hope that if there are people that come from our department in the future to play some role in what the state does, uh, they would come with a very different understanding, ethic, and set of tools. I, I understand your point that the decisions about what should be advocated need to come from indigenous communities but I think all professionals need to have a sense of the principles that should guide what they're working toward. And I think they need to understand how to interact with indigenous communities. You don't just say, I'm an ally. There has to be a way that we can help people learn to actually do that interaction. That's the bigger point of this course. Um, I just, I've been reflecting, listening, and um, I'm, I'm actually at a playground right now because it's my son's second birthday. So if it looks like I'm at a playground, I am at a playground. Um, so um, a thought that I was having when Robin was discussing the, um, the complex navigation that Indigenous peoples have to navigate when 
like, for example, getting access to land to relocate, um, you know, my community, Shushmaraf, we've, we've been able to get hundreds and millions of dollars to protect in place. Um, but planning forward to move um, to relocate has been significantly harder. Um, and I just think about like, as we discuss history of how land has been parceled and like essentially owned by non-native people, you know, I'll, I think about like the people who are in power and the people who primarily control the way land is, is moved around or owned or how the resources are extracted. Like they're primarily like, like non-indigenous people. And like, you know, if you look at Alaska Native communities who are trying to relocate, like, um, like there are all these like requirements, like you have to have, like you need to apply for this permit or you need to apply for this funding. And like, for me, it's like, for those of the people who are in power or have like control over these programs, it's like, it's like what I think needs to radically change right now is like this acknowledgement that like, indigenous peoples have like been able to take care of our land. And even though much of it has been taken from us, like this idea of like granting us or like restoring our like, you know, not ownership because that's not like the relationship, but like to me, it's just like for those who are in power, like like it's this idea of of being being able to let go Um, Anuk, I'm so sorry. I think we're losing your audio. I wonder if you could um, type type in the chat. And I realize we're we're out of time with the class right now, so we're a little bit over time. But before I know, people will start to filter away. Just to say thank you so much again to Diane and to Robin for your um, and and to Eva and to Anuk for your wonderful engagement today in the discussion. As Larry said, this has been so enlightening and it's so terrific to move forward. So we'll leave this line open if, if you are able to stay. We don't want to um, cut people off. We can stay and discuss a little longer. But I also know if others, if you do need to go on to other engagements, we also want you to have a, a point where you can move on. So thank you so much, everyone. We'll stay. I see Osamu has a hand up. 